Hello, welcome everyone to our review of the 2021 selective test, the writing section specifically. Um, I hope you have had a chance to watch our other sections, our videos reviewing the reading comprehension, maths and thinking skills papers, and hope that you found those helpful. In this video, we'll focus on the writing task from the actual exam from this year, the actual 2021 selective test that our year six students wrote in March this year. Um, uh, this video, we will be covering a number of different things. Um, of course, we'll go through the stimulus itself and think about uh, you know, what is the best approach towards such a stimulus. Uh, we'll discuss the different conventions and features of the text type that was featured, um, as well as you know, hopefully give you guys an approach to planning and structuring your writing pieces in general and what sort of exercises and drills you can continue to work on between now and the 2022 selective test next year. If we can start with the structure of the individual sections of the paper. So this was the number of questions, the time patterns, as well as the weighting of each section as it appeared in this year's test and will likely also appear in the 2022 test. Um, as I mentioned, you know, hopefully you've had a chance to read, to watch our reading, mathematical reasoning and thinking skills review sections. Uh, and you can see that the writing section, uh, you know, of course does have the lowest weighting of all the four papers, but 15% is still not a number that we can take lightly. Um, and uh, again, hopefully by the end of this video, you have a rigorous framework of how to approach structure and write out an effective writing piece. Um, and also think about uh, what practice activities and exercises we can do so that uh, we can fully capitalize on this 15% that the writing section is weighted at. Chaos at the beach. Now this was the stimulus for this year's paper. Um, there's quite a lot of information here to unpack. And indeed, this is one of the major changes to the selective exam as it appeared this year, um, in contrast to previous years. You'll notice immediately that there is a lot of information here and a lot of things to take in from this prompt. Um, and as always, you know, as soon as you see uh, the stimulus, you should read through it and underline keywords and take note about what those keywords can actually indicate and mean for our writing piece. So let's start reading. A shipping container with party accessories has been washed up on a beach. Okay, this is basically just recounting the incident that's occurred. And um, again, it's nice of them to provide some sort of context or background information for you. The container has burst open and the contents have gone everywhere. Crowds of people have rushed to the beach to have a look at the balloons, plastic straws, plates, cups, and fancy dress costumes, etc. So they've just listed all the different uh, things that were in the shipping container itself. Um, and also, again, you know, take note of the information that they provide, which you should reiterate back in your writing piece, the things that you should mention again, things like, you know, crowds of people, you know, this implies that it wasn't a small scale event, you actually had lots of people that came to the beach to have a look and try and find out about a bit more about what happened. Write a newspaper report. This is critical. They've been nice enough to make this in bold for you, but you should still underline this again, because you need to write a newspaper report if they've asked for a news report. If they've asked you for a speech, you have to write a speech, you know, whether it's an advertisement or a persuasive text or a, or a narrative, um, a journal entry, it doesn't matter what the text type is, they could actually specify any text type they like. And you need to have some sort of framework about what are all the different features and conventions of these text types. Um, and uh, again, that's why it's extremely important that you take note of exactly what text type it is that they are looking for. Write a newspaper report about this incident for the local paper. Again, it's a local paper. It's something that's going to be read by, um, you know, local residents, uh, you know, the people that live within this city itself. Um, it's not something that you're going to write for an international audience, in which case, you know, your, your standard of writing, um, the information that you provide would be slightly different. In your report, you could explain what has happened. Again, they're really spelling it out to you, right? They're telling you all the different things that you need to include in your writing piece. Um, explain what has happened. This is basically just uh, recounting, recounting the events that have occurred. Describe the impact on the beach and the sea, right? So um, not just the impacts on the people, but also specifically on the you know, waterways, right? What the beach looks like, what the sea and the ocean looks like. Include comments from different people. Uh, well, that's basically just saying include some statements from, um, you know, different people that were involved in this incident. Um, at the end of the day, what is a news article without statements, right? You can have statements from witnesses, you can have quotes from authorities, but you need to have these comments in there. And on top of that, we'll look at what additional things we can explore to make your writing piece much more effective. Okay, now 
the moment it asks, uh, sorry, before we get into that, let's also have a look at the instructions that they provide uh, just so we can uh, see if there's anything specific that we should take note of. Instructions, you have 30 minutes to complete the task. We saw that in the previous, uh, two, uh, previous slide. Um, and only two sides of the paper may be written on. Right. Take note of that. No matter how much you know you want to write, no matter how much your head is brimming with ideas, no matter all the different things that you want to say as part of this newspaper report, you only have two pieces of A4 paper to write on. Right, and that's extremely important. Um, and that's actually one of the other reasons that we say that planning time is extremely, extremely important. They don't give you any extra time for planning, so you need to see how you can incorporate that within the thirty minutes that they give you. Um, Again, every person you know has their own uh, approach to this. Um, just a general guide that I would recommend for the majority of students is just say you have you know split up into five minute sections. You have about five minutes for planning. Um, you have an additional five minutes for each of your three body paragraphs. What does that give us? That's about uh, twenty minutes all up, right? Um, now, of course, five minutes for each body paragraph is really not enough time. Yeah, um, when it comes to your first, you know, body paragraph, you should be spending about seven to eight minutes to, you know, really make it into a, a very effective one. Um, even if your other body paragraphs take something like, you know, about seven minutes each. So if each body paragraph takes about seven minutes, um, that gives us about, you know, 27 minutes altogether. And then you have about three minutes just to, you know, write your conclusion, have a quick read through what you have written. Um, again, if you want to take, say, a minute off each of these you know, second and third body, body paragraphs and dedicate that towards editing and reading through your piece and fixing it, you can do that as well. And that's why I'm saying, you know, time management is quite flexible when it comes to how you spend these 30 minutes. But the only non-negotiable aspect of this, in my opinion, is the five minutes that you absolutely have to spend for planning before you pick up your pen to start writing the other sections. All right. Now, again, this is a... Um, uh, of a very broad generalization that you have about seven or six minutes for each body paragraph. It does vary from text type to text type. And as we look further into a news report, you'll realize that it doesn't really have distinct body paragraphs. That's not the way that a news report is structured. So, you know, this is, um, uh, this is a, a gross generalization for text types where you do have distinct body paragraphs, but the concepts that we're gonna cover is pretty much the same. It's universal for all your different text types, um, no matter what they ask you to write. It says, you may use the blank space below for planning. Now, uh, typically what the booklet looks like is, you know, you have the front, front cover, you know, you have your, you know, student details over there. They give you all these instructions at the front of it. Um, that's what the first page looks like. Uh, when they say your time starts now and you flip this page, then you have, you know, two pages that look like this. Um, on this page, you know, you'll see the stimulus, which was what we saw on the previous page. And then they leave the rest of the space blank, right? And that's a lot of paper that you can use to write um, to draw up a really effective plan and even brainstorm what are all the different things that you're going to talk about and write about. Then you have, you know, a ruled piece of paper for page two, a similar ruled piece of paper for page three, and you're only allowed to use those two A4 pieces of paper, um, and that's what your booklet effectively looks like. Now, before we start writing straight away, or before we even start thinking about how we're going to plan our writing piece, it's really important to think about the marking criteria. Um, you know, understanding the psychology of markers and what exactly they're looking for is fundamental to doing extremely well in your writing pieces. And there's lots of different structures and styles of marking. Um, at the end of the day, the department doesn't actually release exactly how their marking works. All we know is by the time you finish and get your results back, they give you a writing score as a number out of 50. Um, and then you look at, you basically look at that score. It still doesn't tell you very much. Um, it certainly doesn't tell you how you went compared to everyone else. Um, a more conventional way of marking is um, one that, you know, a lot of uh, other centers use. Um, you might even see certain school teachers use this system where, um, you know, the marks work in terms of distinct bands or ranges. So, you know, something like about 13 or 14, that might just be your average range of scores. You know, someone that goes above average is probably getting something like 15, 16 or 17. If you're getting 18 to 20, that's a truly exceptional writing piece that really stands out from um, what everyone else has written. And then over here, of course, you have your below average bands, which we're not going to talk about today because we want everyone to be exceptional. What features make a writing piece above average and what additional techniques can we use to be exceptional um, over here? So let's have a look at um, you know, what, the, what Cambridge markers typically look for. Again, you can see that they have distinct bands. In this case, you know, it ranges from band one all the way to band five. 
Um, I'll leave this page over here for you guys to have a read through. You know, you can have a look through it and think about, okay, you know, what are all these, um, you know, different things they're looking for. But for most students, you know, the language over here is uh, maybe a bit difficult to follow, a little bit hard to understand. So let me just try and um, expand and clarify on the main things that any marker would look at. Any marker, whether it's your school teacher, whether it's a tutor that you have, whether it's a friend of yours that's looking over your writing piece, even though they might not know it, they're really looking at a couple of fundamental things. First one is your content. What exactly is it that you are writing about, right? So we call this the content or the what. What are you talking about? Right. In other words, how good are your ideas? Right? Are your ideas relevant? Are they consistently connected to the stimulus? And again, I repeat, emphasis on the word consistently connected to the stimulus. Um, you know, some people start off with a very strong connection to all the different things that uh, you know the stimulus has already mentioned for you, but um, after that, it fades off as you read further and further. Right. So not only are we connected to stimulus but it needs to be a consistent link that is throughout your writing piece, right? Don't lose focus. Always you know, go back to your plan, go back to the stimulus, make sure that you keep everything really, really tight and well-connected, right? Beyond that, they're looking at your, the quality of your ideas, right? Do you have ideas that are unique? Are they mature? And what are all the different features that we should be thinking about um, when it comes to the idea itself? And we'll discuss this a little bit further in the video, but that's one thing that they're looking for, right? Um, just in terms of your pure ideas, how good are they? The second thing is your expression, which is how you go about writing the things that you want to write, right? So, um, you know, how good is your expression? Are you, you know, is, is your language quite sophisticated? Are you using advanced vocabulary? Uh, do you have a unique and different way of expressing something? Um, are your sentences boring or repetitive and saying the same thing over and over? Or do you really switch it up um, and, uh, you know, create a lot of interest, you know, with, with how you say things, right, within your reader, right? That's another thing you're looking for. And then, uh, especially with the new text types, with the fact that they can be really, really specific with the text types, they're also looking at how both of these things, um, you know, connect to the text type itself. Have you demonstrated to the marker that you have a really solid understanding of all the different features of the text type, um, have a good understanding of the purpose of the text, you know, the audience and who is going to be reading it, um, and, you know, how both of these factors merge into that. These are really the three key things that, um, you know, any marker is looking for. And it depends on, um, you know, how well you're able to address those three key features that determines a band five or an 18 to 20 response. Um, of course, to, you know, be above average, you need to start with a plan. And let's look at what are the different things that you should be looking for with the plan itself, right? So conventions, right? What are the key critical features of this text type? News report is what they have mentioned they want you to write, okay? Now, what you're gonna do is pause the video and think about what are all the different features of a news report, right? Um, and then unpause the video and we'll talk about a few of these. Okay. You would have some sort of idea of what a news report is, right? Whether you, you know, sit there and read the news every morning, which I really doubt most of you guys do, um, or, you know, you just uh, walk past a newsstand and you see an article that's published over there, or maybe you've read news reports as part of, uh, you know, your school curriculum, um, or maybe you've, you know, decided after, you know, seeing the 2021 test that you wanted to go to ABC News and just, you know, have a look at what an article looks like, right? And straight away in your mind's eye, you should be able to visualize, you know, what that news report looked like, right? And there are some key critical features that immediately stand out, right? First thing is you would notice that it has a big, bold headline, right? Something like the title of a news report. You might have even, um, you know, seen a second line, right? Uh, which has, you know, the author's name. It has the date of the publication. You'll notice that the paragraphs are virtually non-existent. They don't really have paragraphs. They're actually just sentences. Um, and, you know, one sentence will kind of stand on its own. Own. So, you know, you'll have a sentence over here, a big chunk of text, then they leave a bit of a break and they go on to the next sentence. So really what you end up having is um, mini, tiny one sentence paragraphs, right? And that's a very common feature of a news report. You might see a couple of pictures here and there for a news report. Um, you know, you might have, you know, witness statements and quotes from different people throughout. You might see some stats some statistics. All of these are things that you expect in a news report, you expect it to have. And the moment you look at the stimulus and it specifies the text type, immediately it should trigger in your mind's eye a visualization of what key features this text type has, 
right? And that includes, you know, the structure of the news report, as we just mentioned, but not just that, also the language, you know, the, the way um, that the, uh, this news report uh, reads out, um, the formality, you know, if you're writing a letter rather than, a, uh, um, rather than, you know, something like a recount or a story, you have obviously a very different level of formality. And that also depends on the audience, right? So if you're writing a letter to the queen, obviously you will have a much more formal and sophisticated tone um, compared to if you're writing a letter to your best friend. Right. Modality. Right. You know, how convincing you want to be. Um, are you, uh, do you actually have some sort of agenda in the case of a news report? Are you trying to have, you know, some sort of perspective? Are you trying to introduce some sort of bias um, in your news report? Right. So these are all different features that you should be able to think about um, as soon as you read the stimulus. And don't just. Um, yes, you should be running these things through in your head, but there are lots of different features that you should actually write down, right? They give you space to plan. You should be using that space effectively. And even outside of the exam, when you're doing practice papers and things, you know, give yourself a bit of scrap paper um, and actually, you know, jot down the things that you're planning. So uh, in the case of a news report, right, all the things that I mentioned before, right, that had about five or six different points, I would go ahead and write those down just in case I forgot to include those. And um, even if I didn't forget, at least to have some sort of reference point to go back to. Remember that an exam is actually a fairly stressful situation. It's easy to forget things in the heat of the moment. So it's good to just have some sort of list to fall back on, right? You should also in your plan include the purpose, right? What is the purpose of any generic news report? Well, it's to inform the reader, right? You're trying to pretty much provide a bit of um, information, right? You're trying to inform the reader about the incident, Right. Um, maybe you have, you know, some news articles actually have some sort of agenda. So maybe you're actually trying to, you know, convince them to do something, uh, convince them to think something. Right. Um, but that will obviously depend on the stimulus itself. But either way, have a, uh, you know, just take the time to write one sentence about the main purpose of this article. Right. And the purpose is really also guided by the audience. Right. Who is it that will be reading your report? Um, sorry, reading your text. And how does that affect things like the structure and the language? Right. Remember, the structure of a news report is very deliberately designed because because of the audience that's reading it. And again, as we watch further into the video, you'll see, um, you know, what features are there specifically to grasp the audience's attention um, and how it's specific to the type of audience that reads a news report. Um, and then comes your ideas themselves. So once you show yourself that you have an awareness of these key features, um, that's when you can sit there and start brainstorming ideas. Um, the approach we generally recommend to students is take about two, three minutes to just write down as many ideas as you can, right? It doesn't matter if it's a list of about 10 different things, but once you have that, see if you can group some of these ideas together, right? Um, or see if you can uh, cut out certain ideas altogether, right? Just completely cut them out. You should only choose ideas which at the end of the day are unique, right? There are thousands and thousands of students writing, uh, you know, any exam and you want your response to stand out amongst these thousands. So your ideas themselves have to be fairly unique, right? Not even just your expression, not your approach, but just the quality of your ideas themselves. Mature, right? Again, re readers and markers are really drawn to um, ideas that, are, that demonstrate maturity that show that uh, it's not just another 10 year old or 11 year old that's writing this piece. It's someone who's able to, you know, think about the real world, think about how something like this would actually happen in the real world. Um, and also think about what different elements combine to create this story, right? Um, remember how before I was talking about, you could have a bunch of different ideas and then group them together. Well, grouping ideas together, as long as they are relevant and groupable um, is how you can create ideas that are a lot more detailed while also specific at the same time, right? Let me give you guys an example. Let's say instead of a news report, we had to write a review, right? You had to write a review of the uh, latest uh, phone to release into the market, right? Let's just say it's, I don't know, the brand new iPhone. Now, when you're just coming up with uh, different features and you know, ideas, things that you want to talk about in your review, you would make a whole list of different things, right? So let's say, um, you know, when I'm talking about all the great things about this phone, I want to talk about how it's really light, how it's quite sleek, right? Um, I might talk about how it has Gorilla Glass, which is like a really tough glass to make sure that it's, um, you know, quite durable. At the end of the day, the main thing I'm going for here is durable, right? Um, maybe I also want to talk about how it has, um, you know, a fingerprint scanner. Okay, then I want to talk about how 
it has access to lots of different apps, right? There are heaps and heaps of different apps that I can download on this phone. Um, and then maybe it has some really good, uh, you know, security features and just anything that comes to mind, I've written it down, right? Done. Two minutes, just brainstorm as many things as you can and leave it there. Then you can think about how you can make these ideas that much more effective by cutting and merging ideas, the notion I was talking about before. So to cut and merge ideas, I just have a look through what it is that I've written, right? So I noticed that my latest phone is light, sleek, and durable, right? All of these things, you know, fall under the same category. And that category, when it comes to a review, is talking about the design of the phone. Okay, the design of the phone. You know, again, if I was to spend a bit more time brainstorming, maybe I could even talk about how the phone is really, um, you know, good looking. Right, so it's sleek and it is good looking, right? Notice that, you know, I haven't really taken the time to, you know, draw the distinction or the differences between these two features. I just write them both down. But now I know that this, all of this comes under a subheading of design. And within design, I can talk about, you know, um, the fact that it is durable, the fact that it's tough and uses Gorilla Glass, right? I can talk about, you know, how it is aesthetic and that's that idea of it being good looking, right? Um, and I can also talk about, um, how it is you know, light and sleek and easy to handle. Uh, maybe these are features that make it very ergonomic, right? So within this concept of design, my body paragraph is mainly going to deal with design. And within this body paragraph, I'm gonna have you know, three different sub points, right? And I only have these three sub points because I took the time to brainstorm a bunch of different ideas, way more than I needed, and then cut it down, um, sorry, not cut down, and then merge it into you know, a group of similar ideas. Right. Similarly, if I look at this one here, fingerprint scanner and security, well, those can also be combined. In fact, a uh, fingerprint scanner is just a sub point within this main idea of security. Right. So this is going to be my main idea within a, with a body paragraph. And this is going to be a smaller idea. That's, um, you know, one of the examples that I'm going to give in that body paragraph. Right. And then apps is a decent idea that can just stand on its own. Um, so I'll just leave that as is. So by merging, you know, a bunch of these different ideas, um, you know, I've shown the marker that, uh, you know, my response is ultimately going to be quite comprehensive. And that's exactly what any marker wants to see. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you know, going on with that idea of having a detailed idea, um, you also want to develop maturity by showing things that are re realistic and reasonable in the way that it would happen in the actual real life. Okay, moving on to the news report itself, right? Um, again, remember, before I asked you to think about all the different features of a news report, and now we'll spend some time just going into them in a bit more um, detail. It all starts with a headline, right? Remember the first thing that grabs your attention in a news report is a headline and a headline, it is essential that, uh, you know, a headline is um, catchy, right? Something that as soon as the reader reads, they don't just stop there and move on. They actually want to go ahead and uh, move on to the rest of the article, right? Most news um, headlines tend to be quite short, right? But uh, if it's lengthy, uh, you know, it's, it's acceptable. The key thing is that it's engaging. Okay, it needs to be catchy and engaging, it needs to grip the reader, really stand out and grab their attention, right? At the most basic level, we can have a headline that's, um, you know, quite vague and almost mysterious. Um, so the one that they've gone with is chaos at the beach, right? So they've gone with this headline, chaos at the beach. As far as headlines go, this is not bad. As I said, it's, yeah, sure, it can come across as a bit vague, but really what the uh, author is trying to do is create something that's mysterious, right? Chaos at the beach could be anything, right? It could refer to a beach party that goes wrong. It could re uh, re refer to the actual situation here where party supplies spilled onto the beach. It could refer to a situation where, I don't know, a bunch of different sharks have like washed up onto the shore and now everyone's scared, right? Um, it could be whale sightings, right? We've seen whales off the Bondi coast and now everyone's flocking to the beach, right? And it's creating, you know, pandemonium. Um, maybe there's some sort of traffic incident right next to the beach and that's caused chaos. Again, there are so many different ways that chaos at the beach can happen, but the fact that the author has deliberately made it a bit vague means that this is a bit mysterious, a bit engaging. They, you know, you want to read further to find out exactly what happened at the beach itself. Now, there are lots of other ways that you can make a headline quite effective, right? Um, this is, you know, an article that we'll be using today just to give you guys an idea of how news reports work in the real world. Um, it says, wildfires rage in California and Oregon amid scorching heat wave. Okay, let's just unpack this for a second, see if there's anything that it did well or things that it could do better. Now, the purpose of this headline is 
simply just to explain what's happened and where it's happening, right? We have wildfires. They are in California and Oregon. So you know that it's in America um, and you know that it's in the context of a heat wave, right? So it's in the middle of summer, there's a scorching heat wave and this has caused fires in California and Oregon. Is this a particularly engaging or gripping headline? Not really. I mean, it doesn't grasp the reader's attention in any particular way. Um, it's just something that, you know, if someone was looking for information about, you know, heat waves or bushfires, um, it mentions that very clearly, very explicitly. So the reader would then go ahead and read it, you know, would want to read it. But as I was saying before, there are specific techniques that we can use to make the headline, um, you know, a lot more engaging and would definitely be expected in your news reports, um, what we call an advanced headline. So let's look at within the context of chaos at the beach, right? What techniques are there to make a high quality headline? Well, you'll notice that a lot of news articles try to have a bit of alliteration um, to, you know, again, just create a bit of uh, interest, a bit of visual flair. Um, an example would be if I was to look at just the previous one, wildfires rage in California and Oregon, um, there was another news uh, company, it wasn't Al Jazeera, it was someone else. I think it was uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation, not 100% sure, but they said something like, Western wildfires, right? And then they had a colon and then they went on to, you know, uh, talk a bit more about, you know, what actually happened. So just something like, um, you know, uh, scorching heat wave leads to bushfires, something like that. But either way, they start off with a pun, which engages the reader, right? So that is one, uh, albeit basic way, it's still, um, you know, quite effective and still very, a, a very common way of engaging the reader um, using alliteration. If we were to put that in Chaos of the Beach, it might be something like, Party pandemonium off the Pacific, right? Remember, this is still kind of mysterious, right? We don't say much. Firstly, we've used a much better word for chaos. If they mention chaos at the beach, you don't wanna keep going on and on using the same word, right? So we've used pandemonium instead of chaos. Party pandemonium. Again, the reader is you know, immediately engaged because they're not sure you know, exactly what's happened and that's why you want to keep things um, somewhat mysterious, right? And But we do know that it's something related to party stuff right maybe there was an actual party that happened but uh, i guess it can just be our little secret for now that it was to do with party supplies right the reader doesn't know that just yet um, and we can leave it that way until they start reading a bit further and then you know obviously we grab their attention that way um party pandemonium off the pacific again notice i didn't just say beach it's very very tempting when they uh, you know talk about this incident that happened um at the beach to keep go, you know, going ahead and using this over and over and over. In fact, some planning techniques actually recommend that the moment they give you a stimulus, after you've identified the key words, see if you can come up with some synonyms um, and not only synonyms, but also expressions, right? Interesting expressions for these key words, right? For example, if you had a stimulus and it was talking about Japan, you don't just keep going on and saying, you know, Japan, Japan here, Japan this, Japan that. Um, sometimes if you say something like um, the land, of cherry blossoms, right? An icon of Japan, right? Or the land of Mount Fuji, right? Or the land of, land of the rising sun, right? These are interesting expressions to say the same thing. Likewise, when we're talking about a beach, right? Um, you can use uh, coast, right? You can have a specific um, sea. So it's like a, you know, a, a sea or an ocean, right? So in this case, I've decided to go with um, the Pacific, right? Um, you could talk about a specific beach. So in this case, you know, I mentioned Bondi, um, but, you know, just make sure that you have a, you know, toolbox of different synonyms and expressions that you can use instead of just the keywords in the stimulus um, and recycling them over and over again just comes across very boring. So party pandemonium off the Pacific uses alliteration as an example of a technique to improve headlines. Another one would be using some sort of metaphor, right? Sea of plastic ruins Bondi, right? So in this case, you know, it's uh, metaphorically comparing, um, you know, the uh, sheer quantity of plastic that's washed off to a sea, right? You have not just a little bit of plastic, but a whole sea of plastic um, uh, that is ruining Bondi. Again, this is uh, also considered a good headline because it um, immediately makes the position of the author very clear. You straight away know that this is author is not being um, neutral. You don't think that, you know, he, he clearly doesn't think that this was a good incident or uh, something that was beneficial. He's telling you that it just ruins Bondi, right? So this shows the position of author, right? And that's something that a lot, lot of, uh, news reports, magazine articles will do um, to try and, you know, get the reader to have the same perspective or the same position as the authors themselves.
right? Metaphors, very effective. On the same note, I'm sure you could find a way of using a simile as well in your headlines. Puns, right? Headlines are notorious, um, sometimes even infamous for using puns, sometimes extremely funny, sometimes quite lame, but uh, either way, you know, puns are um, a technique that you can use in headlines. For example, shipping container blew up in my face, right? Now, um, this is, you know, almost a bit of a ridiculous headline. It's probably something you can, ex you would expect in a, like a tabloid rather than a well-reputed news report, but you can see that it's, um, you know, it's, it's clearly, it has quotation marks. It's something of a quote from a, from a local resident. Um, and same thing, right? You also, it also gives away the overall position, which is a negative position. This local is clearly not happy about the shipping container that's spilled over. He said, uses the expression blew up. If something blows up in your face, um, that means that something has gone really drastically wrong, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's a pun on that. And it also incorporates a quote um, as, a, as an interesting way of starting a news report. Another very common thing, again, something that you might find in like a tabloid is the use of exaggeration or hyperbole, right? Um, this is also a way of getting the reader's attention because um, it's, it's really exaggerating the events that have happened and the person that's reading the report wants to find out a bit more about, you know, whether it really was that extreme um, or whether you were just exaggerating, right? Shipping company throws worst party ever, right? This is really strange. Again, this is a bit of a mysterious headline. Um, what does it mean when it, says, when it says a shipping container, sorry, a shipping company throws a party? That's not something that most shipping companies do, right? So already it's a bit quirky and a bit strange. Um, but add to that, you've mentioned that it's the worst party ever. Um, and, and, you know, all of that uh, feeds into the reader's curiosity. And in fact, that's the purpose of a headline is to pique their curiosity. Even if you're not feeling very witty at the moment, all you can think of is something really, really simple, short and basic, something like party, supplies, wash, ashore, right? All you've done is just said what's happened, right? There's nothing that's particularly witty or unique. There are no real techniques that are used here. That's still okay, especially in this context, as long as we have some sort of headline. And to be completely frank with you, this is pretty quirky as is, right? No one really expects party supplies to wash ashore. It's you know, not exactly a common occurrence. Um, so at the end of the day, you really wanna have a good headline, but having some headline is better than no headline, right? Even if you don't think it's very good. Okay, let's move on to the features, you know, the structure of a news report. A news report is a blend of different things, right? And that's what makes it a very exciting text type uh, to write um, is that, uh, there's a lot more flexibility in a news report compared to a lot of other text types. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in text types like, um, of course, news reports, but also things like speeches where your individual, your individual um, you know, styles and ways of writing can really shine. Um, also persuasive texts. Again, you can really you know, come across um, with a lot of uh, style and flair, but um, you know, what makes a news report unique and what are the things that we should have in a news report? Remember the primary purpose of a news report is to recount events, right? We wanna talk about what is happening or what has happened if it was in the past, All right? That's probably the primary purpose of it. And in tandem with that, alongside that, most news reports um, or rather most news readers also wanna find out some more details about what's happened, right? So like they really wanna get into the nitty gritty and find out more about the specifics, right? At the end of the day, if someone just sat there and watched the news headlines, that would cover the main stories in you know, about two minutes. Um, and the more interested readers wanna find out more about the details about that story itself, right? Description, again, this is another way of engaging the reader. Um, it's a really useful thing that uh, this writing stimulus actually mentions words like you know, crowds of people. It talks about all the individual things, the actual supplies that drop. And you can definitely have a bit of description um, about you know, what this crowd looks like, you know, what these party supplies that have been you know, washed up onto the beach look like. Um, and that's not only a way of engaging the reader, but uh, as a sneaky side point, right, a bit of a cheeky agenda that we have here, it's also a great way of impressing the marker. Right. One of the downsides of the fact that they have been so specific with what they're looking for, right? They mention individual things that you could include. They, talk, they say things like, you know, talk about the impacts on the beach um, and the sea. Talk about, uh, you know, the people that were involved in this incident, right? Um, you know, have some statements from people. They are really, you know, telling you exactly what they're looking for. The downside to that is that, uh, again, thousands of students are going to be doing the same thing. Um, and you need to really find some sort of... Uh, 
uh, advantage, right? Some sort of strategic advantage in how you can stand out and impress the marker. And one great way of doing that is to really tap into your um, abilities to describe the scene, right? How well can you provide description and uh, you know impress the marker that way? Other critical features of news reports, as I said, are statements, right? And we'll go into a little bit about how you can brainstorm and think about, um, you know, what sort of statements to include. Um, and then directions or a call to action, right? Some news um, reports, especially if they have some sort of agenda, if they have some sort of message that they're trying to push or some sort of um, uh, thing that they want the readers to do, right? That's what we call a direction or a call to action. Um, and they often include that towards the end of the article. Right. In this case, you know, if we're talking about the negative impacts that this has had on the beach, if we're talking about, you know, how it takes a long time to go ahead and clear, you might say something like readers that are very passionate about, you know, our waterways um, can volunteer to help clean up the beach by calling this number. Right. Um, or if it's an expensive effort to clean up the beach, again, you can say the same thing. Readers who are very passionate about our waterways um, and preserving Australian flora and fauna can uh, donate to um, you know, the, this organized so-and-so organization, uh, and then just have a link to a website there, right? So having some sort of directional call to action is also um, a nice way of showing the marker that you're well aware of all these different features that a news report has, but ultimately it's just a blend of events, description, uh, people's opinions, um, and, and obviously the facts themselves, all right? Now, because your audience is a large number, right? It's a large number of general people, right? Just general audiences. They're not particularly, um, you know, educated about one specific field, right? They're not scientists or marine biologists or, um, uh, you know, they're not all, say, members of the council that know exactly what's happening. They're not all members of, you know, shipping and logistics companies. Um, they're just general people, right? So that's also another reason that you want to write um, with, you know, the, the masses of people in mind. Um, think about the language that you would use that would be, you know, that would communicate your message, um, you know, while doing things like avoiding jargon. Right? avoid highly technical language that only a few people would understand. Um, generally, a news report is supposed to be neutral. Again, if you want to have some sort of position, you can. And that's another way of showing your individuality, individuality across, right? Um, third person, best to write in third person, uh, best to write in, um, again, it depends on whether it happened in the past or whether it's an evolving situation in terms of which tense you want to use. And ultimately, the language is semi-formal. Right. It is formal because at the end of the day, you are trying to impress a marker, um, but at the same time, you know, you're not writing a letter to the queen. Right? So it's uh, you know, semi-formal in that sense. All right. So be acutely aware of all these different things that you um, are expected to have as part of your contents. Um, and these are things that really you should be revising right now as part of you know, the theory that you're studying. Um, you know, whether your tutor is running through you know, theory for the different features of different text types with you, whether it's something that you're revising from a textbook or you know, it's just um, you, know, you and your parents going through this. Um, either way, uh, you do want to make sure that you have a list of key features for different text types because they can ask absolutely anything um, in, in not only the selective test, but uh, even in, in school and beyond. Okay, now that is all fine and dandy in terms of understanding, you know, the different features, but what does that actually look like? You know, how can we look at these features and see, you know, how does that translate to an actual news report? Well, to help you guys out, here is an actual news report. Um, so this is, uh, again, this was, remember how before we were talking about the wildfire fires in California and Oregon? Well, that was just the headline and this is the rest of the article. So let's have a quick read through this and see if we can, see if we can identify, um, you know, the key features of a news report that really define this article. Firefighters are working in extreme heat across the Western United States to contain surging wildfires, the largest of which are burning in California and Oregon as another heat wave strains, strains power grids across the region. What do we call this first paragraph? In a news report, this first paragraph is called the lead paragraph, right? The purpose of the lead paragraph is to give you as much information as it can, um, you know, in a very short span of time, right? Now, imagine that you're a working adult and you have a really, really busy life, right? Imagine that you are one of these guys that, uh, you know, have just popped up on the screen, right? Maybe you're this guy over here, right? This guy right here who is in a huge rush 
it actually doesn't look too rushed. Maybe you're this guy over here. He's just gone off the train. He's going to run off to the other side of the platform, right? He's going to try and like rush to platform six to catch this train, which is about to leave in two minutes, right? Either way, the point is that you're in a really, really big hurry um, to, you know, get to your job on time, uh, you know, to do the things that you've had to. At the same time, you're still kind of curious about what's happening in the real world. So you've just picked up a newspaper on your way to the, you know, the train that's leaving in a minute, right? Um, and you have, you know, just like, you know, 30 seconds to take in the news um, that you're super, super interested in, right? So maybe this guy has some family who are living in uh, California or Oregon, um, and he just wants to very quickly find out about what's happening, right? Well, that's why, that's why a news article has been designed with the lead paragraph in mind, right? So if I read none of the news article and only looked at the lead paragraph, does it give me all the information I'm looking for? Let's have a look. So what information do I need? I want to find out where this is happening, right? Burning in California and Oregon. And when I say where this is happening, really, I want to find out also, what is this? You know, what is happening, right? Well, it says here that there are surging wildfires, right, um, in this area, California and Oregon, right? Firefighters are working in extreme heat, right? So it's telling you that, um, you know, everyone's struggling to, you know, keep things, these things contained, keep this fire contained. And it also gives us a little bit of an impact about, you know, what this is having, which is the heat wave is straining power grids across the region, right? Um, remember, something like a, fo a forest fire or a wildfire can have lots of different impacts, right? There are heaps of different impacts that a wildfire can have. If you were to just brainstorm some of them, maybe it could threaten property, right? Meaning that it's, you know, burning close to your house and you need to evacuate, right? Maybe it is affecting forests and wildlife, right? In the, so yeah, and, and like that, again, you can brainstorm a bunch of different impacts, um, but the key impact that this article has chosen to focus on, um, or maybe just the key impact that's, you know, really, really relevant and important to people is that it's straining power grids. Meaning that um, you know everyone's like using aircon, and uh, you know there's uh, you know people are not conserving electricity, and you know all these fires are making temperatures much hotter and making life really hard for people. Um, and the whole power grid, the supply system for electricity, um, is you know going to crack soon, right? So that's the key impact over here. And this lead paragraph has given me all of that information for someone who was in a huge rush to you know get to their destination on time and only had you know about thirty seconds to take in all the information from this article. Okay. Now, when it comes to a lead paragraph, think about what are the key features that uh, any news reader wants to you know, find out about, right? So what we just saw was we saw that um, the lead paragraph immediately gets into what has happened. Okay. What's the incident itself? When did it happen? Where did it happen? Okay. Um, who was involved, right? And then maybe even a very brief explanation of the why. And I know a lot of you guys are sitting there, maybe even like saying this to your screen. Um, hey, that's just who, what, when, where, why, right? We've been doing this at school and I've heard about this before. Um, and yeah, you'd be right. Remember, most introductions will start off by talking about the you know five Ws and the lead paragraph is no exception. It's just that it does it much quicker, right? It uh, just, you know, it does it all in one very brief sentence. Whereas if you're writing, um, you know, a persuasive piece, you pretty much have your entire introduction to, you know, discuss all these things. Um, if it was a discussion piece or an exposition, again, relevant to the stimulus itself, different stimuli ask for different things. Um, but either way, what you would effectively do in one entire introductory paragraph, in the news report we do in just one long sentence. Okay, so when you are planning your news report, you do want to start by planning around these things because that will make your lead paragraph. Um, the way I think about it is, you know, you have this section over here and that forms, you know, the reader's first, um, you know, discovery of the news, right? After that, you're basically going to say that, you know, that, uh, you know, this incident, you know, had a couple of different, um, you know, it was taken up by people in a couple of different ways. And in these couple of different ways, each had their own impacts, right? Um, and that's what makes a really, really comprehensive writing piece, right? You can see, it kind of looks like a banana, but you can see that, you know, there are all these different things that we have addressed in our news article, um, even though we just started off with something that was quite interesting and it branched out in different ways, right? Now, I know that all sounds very abstract, but we'll look at how that actually, um, you know, comes across in a, in a writing piece that's relevant for this stimulus alone. So here's an example of a lead paragraph, one that I prepared earlier. Over the Labor Day long weekend, residents of Kuji woke up aghast at the sight of party supplies strewn across the pristine white sand 
and blankets of plastic washing onto the shore with each wave. All right, so this is my lead paragraph. Let's think about um, you know what this does, what things are good about it. Uh, if you can think of anything that you know needs improvement, of course, you know as you're sitting at home, you're more than welcome to you know go ahead and edit that. In fact, one critical exercise that I would say is really really important for all students to be doing, um, not just now but uh, you know throughout your you know learning journey, um, whenever you do some sort of writing piece, is to edit your own work. Not just edit, actually. Let me correct that. Mark your work. Okay, marking your work and even marking other people's work is an extremely effective way of improving your knowledge of what makes um, a writing piece good uh, and also being able to not only identify what features you know, need to be improved, but actually how to do that. Right. So if you're able to look at a writing piece and think about, you know, what are all the things that it's done well and what are all the things that it has done not so well, and then go ahead and make those changes to make it better. Um, that's a really critical step in, um, in, in, in improving your, your own writing standards, um, as well as, uh, you know, your ability to read through your piece um, and, you know, make edits as you go, rather than leaving all of it to the very end, right? So, um, you know, if you only have about, say, 10 minutes a day, that's all you have for writing, you have no more than that, you're not able to sit there and, you know, spend half an hour going through a prompt, um, you're not able to spend, uh, you know, one hour reviewing all the theory that you've learned, all you have is just 10 minutes. Um, well, there's heaps and heaps of different ways that you can spend 10 minutes and still make it very productive for writing. But, um, you know, one of those ways is just to take one of your writing pieces from the past, make some edits along, and ultimately give yourself some feedback in terms of things that you've done well and things that you can improve on. Very, very powerful way of seeing improvement in your writing. Um, so let's go ahead and look at uh, the good features of this piece. Over the Labor Day long weekend, all right? So this is the when? Okay. Residence of Kuji. This is the who. And you can see that the who is actually extremely specific, right? Um, it actually is, is, is also where, right? So Kuji tells us where this incident has happened, right? So here we have the who, right? Residence. And over here we have the where, right? They woke up. A gas. Now, this is something that I always encourage students to do, which is weave and incorporate some sort of, um, you know, emotions into your writing piece, right? Um, emotions are, again, a very effective way of demonstrating to the marker that you are quite mature and you're able to think about things, um, you know, in a very mature and sophisticated way, right? And it's a very simple way of, um, you know, also expressing your own personal style, Right? Your personal style and your personal agenda um, is, is one of the reasons that I always try and um, weave in some sort of emotion uh, into, you know, any writing piece. Um, and, you know, obviously you want to start off strong. So I've done that straight away in my lead paragraph. And um, not only that, it's, uh, you know, in general, where you can help it with any sort of emotion, um, don't just uh, tell the emotion. You want to actually show them, you know, how someone is feeling. Right? You want to show how someone is feeling. Uh, again, there are lots of different exercises and a simple one that you can do is just brainstorm a couple of different emotions, right? Maybe someone's feeling sad. Maybe someone's feeling angry. Maybe someone's feeling happy. Maybe they're not just happy, they're beyond that. They are excited. Perhaps they're nervous. Maybe they are frustrated. Okay, just sit there and brainstorm a few different emotions um, and then see if you can come up with three different ways um, of expressing that emotion by showing that a person is feeling that rather than by telling them that they're feeling that, right? So rather than saying, you know, John was sad about this or Chris was angry about this or, um, you know, David was excited about this, rather than just saying that, which is very superficial, see if you can come up with expressions for showing that, right? So, um, you know, expression to show that someone is angry, maybe something like with um, clenched fists, clenched fists, right? He did it with clenched fists. He did it with gritted, or he did it while gritting his teeth, All right? Um, again, when it comes to happiness, um, or even in the case of, you know, being excited about something, right? Um, rather than, you know, saying that uh, he was ecstatic or he was happy, and then, you know, vocab is always a good way of, um, you know, synonyms are a great way of expressing something rather than using basic words. Um, but even better than, that, better than that would be to say something like he was on, you know, cloud nine, right? Um, he was in seventh heaven, right? Or uh, jumping up and down, right? I know it's really basic to write something like jumping up and down is very basic, but it's still a step up from just saying he was excited, right? If someone is sad, you might say something like choking back tears, okay? If someone is surprised 
about something, then you can say something like with their mouth agape, right? So if their mouth is wide open, then you know clearly they're surprised by what they're seeing, right? So again, um, remember, as I was saying before, if you only have 10 minutes to spend on writing, there are lots of really, really powerful drills and activities that you can do. And this is another one of them. Um, just spend about, you know, a couple of minutes brainstorming a few different emotions and then the rest of your time thinking about not only synonyms for these words, but also expressions um, and actions and reactions of people to show that they're feeling this particular emotion. Okay, so, you know, yeah, so I think I've mentioned uh, we have the key details over here, right? We said that they were aghast at the site. So, um, uh, the uh, you know weaving in a bit of emotion in there um, at the site of party supplies strewn across the pristine sand blankets of plastic washing onto the shore um, this is basically the what right so I'm talking about what has happened um, and if I was to go very very specifically the site of party supplies strewn across strewn across the sand is just a much better way right it's a more um, advanced way of expressing a basic statement such as uh, party supplies washed onto the beach, right? This is really, really basic. And this is probably what, you know, 90% of um, average students would write. So you can see that, um, you know, the expression that's used in this sentence um, is, is a much more fluent and, um, you know, artistic way of saying the same thing, right? Party supplies strewn across the pristine sand, right? So there's a use of um, you know, advanced vocab, right? Blankets of plastic, uh, you have a metaphor over here, washing onto the shore with each wave gives us uh, some sort of sense that uh, something like this is actually getting worse, right? It's, uh, it's giving us uh, something of a timeline, you know, for the impacts, which is not just that, you know, this happened over the weekend and, and you know, it's just left there. We're just saying that the incident was getting worse and worse, right? So it was a worsening situation. Okay, so that's a effectively paragraph. Uh, okay. And then we go on further to add some more details. Now, if you look at a professional news article, so if I just go back to the one that we had earlier, this one over here, um, you can see that uh, it only has one sentence per paragraph, right? All they do is one sentence over here, then they have a bit of a line break, they have, you know, a sentence over here. You wouldn't really call these paragraphs, but the point is that, you know, it's always a sentence followed by, you know, a break and then a sentence and then a break. So it's not following your conventional way of having distinct, large, chunky body paragraphs. Uh, of course, there is a bit of a flexibility in terms of how you approach it. Um, in this case, you know, what we've decided to do was as part of my lead paragraph, just so that it's not too abrupt for the marker, uh, it makes sense in this context to add in a little bit more information about what's happened. All we know so far is that party supplies have washed onto the beach, but there's no context here. So we go ahead and add in a little bit more context. Alpha One Shipping Company, I hope this never happens to a company, especially, you know, one that we start if we ever go into the shipping market, but I've just decided to call it that. Alpha One Shipping Company was responsible for delivering several tons of party supplies ahead of Halloween festivities. Again, a great way of showing your sophistication as a writer is to be specific, right? I have been extremely specific in mentioning not only the name of the shipping company, but also what they were responsible for doing, how much um, they needed to supply, right? So in this case, uh, it was several tons of party supplies and what these things were being supplied for, which was Halloween, right? So that also gives me an indication of the time frame in which this story takes place. It's not really a story, but, um, you know, of course, you know, I am making up facts. So it gives us some sort of time frame. They claim that unprecedented weather events led to several containers worth of cargo to, f is this grammatically correct? Unprecedented weather events led to several containers worth of cargo uh, yeah, to fall overboard or like uh, led to them falling overboard. Uh, again, there's a bit of an edit that needs to be made there in terms of um, grammar, uh, leading to huge losses for the company, right? So uh, another great way of demonstrating maturity is to marry cause and effect, right? So a basic sentence would say something like, um, you know, Alpha One Shipping Company, you know, had to uh, deliver supplies, had to deliver party supplies, um, and, you know, things went wrong. And that's a very basic, vague uh, sentence. In this case, we have even given them some sort of hypothesis of what happened and why it happened, right? So remember the five W's, who, what, when, where, and the fifth one is why um, or how. Okay, and we've gone ahead and actually included that in our lead paragraph over here, right? Unprecedented weather events, 
um, cargo fell aboard, and the effect of that was it led to huge losses for the company. Now, remember before I gave you guys that, uh, that sort of analogy where you start off with a fairly strong, um, you know, introduction that grips the reader. Then you can talk about, you know, what are the different ways that this uh, could have been perceived, and then you get into different impacts, right? And that's sort of what I've started to do over here. So. I've mentioned a couple of different things, right? The first thing is how the residents reacted. Okay, the residents' reaction was that they were aghast that such a thing has happened, right? Again, we're using an extreme emotion. Another thing is I've mentioned that the shipping company, the shipping company has suffered huge losses. Okay, I've also kind of introduced the beach as a character, you know, started talking about how all the supplies are, um, you know, littering the beach. Right. And that's where I'm talking about, you know, how, you know, this one incident uh, can pan out in different ways and what individual impacts each of these different ways have. So if you remember before when I was talking about how when you plan, um, you know, a response, I use the example of a of a review, um, of, a, of a product review, you know, you have a bunch of different ideas that you group together because that adds a lot more detail to each paragraph. Well, this is how I'm going to go ahead and, you know, use the same concept in a news report, right? How can I pack in lots of different details into it um, and explore, you know, three, two or three key things in depth. In the case of a news report, a news report fundamentally focuses on uh, you know, the impacts, right? It fundamentally focuses on all the different, uh, you know, impacts of the incident, right? When it comes to your planning time, what you need to do, especially for this news report, is sit there and brainstorm as many different impacts as you can, and then think about the people that were involved, right? Um, and, you know, as part of this uh, connection between people and impacts, you have your statements. So what sort of statements are we going to give? So let's, you know, take a sec again, if you want to make this a bit of an activity, um, just pause the video right now and brainstorm a list of as many impacts as you can think of um, for this stimulus, for this event that's just happened, which is shipping container has exploded and has leaked all its party supplies onto the beach. Pause the video and think about all the different impacts. See if you can brainstorm about, you know, six or seven different impacts um, in about two or three minutes. Okay, so here are some impacts that you may have come up with, right? You notice that I have way more here than I really need. Um, and uh, in fact, if you have two minutes, just that, that's a good thing. That's what you should be doing is, you know, give yourself more ideas than you need. And then you have the choice of picking the best ideas, right? The most unique, the most mature, and the most detailed ideas. So first one over here, residents had to clean up the beach, right? Well, that's not very fair. And you can think about, you know, the response that that would have created. A lot of residents would complain that this is unfair. This is, you know, frustrating. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, maybe they find someone else to blame, like the council has not been doing a great job, right? And it's just not good that the residents had to clean up. But this is the approach you should have, right? When you pick an impact, um, think about uh, what are all the different things that this impact, um, you know, can, can lead to, right? What sort of emotional reactions can it inspire? Um, and on that same note, right, who can we ask as state, uh, who can we who can we involve in this story, right? Who are the people um, that we can explore their emotions for? And who are the people that are there to provide statements, right? So as soon as this happens, you follow that up with the different people that are involved, right? In this case, obviously it's the residents, right? Marine life affected, you know, of course, if you have, you know, all of this plastic and gunk and junk in the water, right, in the ocean, um, you know, that's going to affect marine life, right? So again, um, this is one of the impacts that you could have. And if you have this impact, Think about the people who are in a position to care about this issue and what sort of emotions um, this would, you know, evoke on them, I'm sorry, evoke from them. And also think about the nature of the statement that you can extract from these people, right? So if marine life have been affected, you know, a good person to ask would be someone like a marine biologist uh, who can give you a fair, um, unbiased opinion about, you know, the situation over here, All right? Loss of tourism, right? Who would you ask? Tourism board, right? Tourism Australia, all right? They can tell you a bit more information about the uh, loss of tourism that's affecting this place. Um, but not only those guys, you can also ask business owners, right? If you're a ice cream vendor um, of Bondi, right? And you make a killing selling ice cream and suddenly no one's coming to the beach anymore because it's polluted and looks bad, right? Then you've just lost a bunch of money, right? You've just lost a bunch of revenue. Um, you've, yeah, you've been negatively affected by the situation. Right? Now, I know I am focusing a lot on the negative impacts that something like this has had. Um, and of course, that's just my personal position that I'm going for in a story like this, because there's a lot more that you can talk about. But, you know, it doesn't have to be all doom and gloom, right? Maybe you can uh, talk about how 
the children are having heaps of fun, right? All the kids have gone to the beach and they're just playing with these party supplies, right? Maybe the residents are actually happy about the loss of tourism because now they get a lot more quiet time at the beach that they can enjoy themselves, right? So you can look for silver linings in, in situations like this. Um, and in fact, again, it's, it's more mature to think about all the different uh, faces of this story, all the different ways that uh, you know this um, you know story can evolve into. Uh, but uh, yeah, just giving a heads up, you know, don't just be restricted to one way of thinking, um, and, and be quite open-minded with uh, how you're able to approach and think about these uh, issues. Right, and you can see another list of things that I've got here. So you know um, the. the you know, people that visit the beach for recreation can no longer enjoy it. Maybe there are some risks, hazards, and dangers, you know, um, something like this, where there's just so many supplies, you know, strewn across the beach. Uh, you know, maybe there are some sharp things in there that pose a risk to uh, kids that, you know, go off and like, um, you know, touch them, right? Uh, maybe there is like uh, some sort of, um, you know, toxic waste that was there as part of, you know, you know as part of the shipping container. Either way, you can explore, you know, hazards and dangers as well. Um, if you wanted to think really long term, right, maybe this is an unprecedented disaster and it's made the council look really, really bad. It's making the beach look so bad for so long that property prices go down, right? Again, um, think about how something like this would happen in the real world and think about how, you know, an, an adult would be thinking about this story and approaching this story, right? Um, party supply shortage, right? Um, maybe the fact that, uh, you know, there were so many tons of uh, party supplies meant that uh, we won't get enough supplies in time for Halloween, right? This uh, affects the entire supply chain, right? Maybe it's causing disruptions to the traffic. Maybe it's causing issues for the company itself, right? The shipping company has gone through, uh, you know, has um, had so many losses from this incident. Maybe they're even getting sued about something like this, all right? Um, so, you know, really sit, think about all the different impacts, all the different ways that, that something like this can happen. And then you have the luxury of choosing the best ones out of these. Um, and you also have the luxury of combining a few of them so that you can create a more, uh, you know, interesting read um, and definitely a much more detailed analysis of the situation. Okay, I'm aware that this is turning into a very long video. Uh, and perhaps I'm being, you know, too comprehensive for something like this. Um, we'll just spend the rest of the video discussing, uh, you know, just a couple more uh, sentences of an exemplar and, you know, think about what makes this a good piece of writing. Okay, reactions to the event have been mixed, with some residents left mouth agape at the irresponsibility of the shipping company, while others bemused by the bizarre contents of the container. So what am I saying over here? Just that people are thinking about this event in different ways, right? Reactions have been mixed, right? Why did I do that? Because that gives me the flexibility to go ahead and explore different reactions, right? Both positive and negative. So some residents, uh, you know, again, I'm trying to show here rather, rather than tell, right? Some residents are really shocked. Um, they're shocked by, you know, very specific things like how a company can be so irresponsible. And then others, you know, find it almost entertaining, right? So you can tell that they're not really, really as um, fussed or concerned with the situation and they're just bemused or they just think it's, it's a bit strange, it's a bit bizarre, All right? Uh, straight away, you know, I don't waste any time. I go straight into a quote. So these multinational companies should be sued for being so reckless, right? Chided Mrs. Liang, a resident who has been in Kuji for 45 years. So again, straight away, I have a witness statement, right? It's a statement from a resident, someone who the story is actually relevant to. Um, I've re restated where this incident has happened. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously her position is quite clear. And this relates back to the uh, concept of um, residents who are who feel the company has been very irresponsible, right? Um, uses, you know, interesting uh, words, right? So it doesn't just say uh, so-and-so shipping com company, it says multinational companies, right? Always be on the lookout for different ways of expressing something, okay? Um, chided Mrs. Liang. One of the pet gripes, one of the things that almost every marker hates is boring vocab especially boring vocab that's very easy to change, right? And one key way if you're looking for, you know, how can I improve my vocab, right? Remember before I spoke about emotional vocab and how you can come up with synonyms for different emotions. But another key one is replacing common words, right? Replacing common words, okay? And again, one of the uh, pet peeves of a lot of markers is the word said, okay? blah, 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 he said, or so-and-so said that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a really, really bad word, right? And uh, in fact, uh, some of the kids the other day, you know, when we were discussing this, they said, said is 
dead. <laughs> all right, so this is a word that you definitely do not want to use. All right, um, instead, have a look at you know all the different synonyms for said, and also think about what sort of um, what meaning that synonym conveys right so you know let's just say let's give you guys a couple of examples to work with right so let's say one of these is exclaimed okay one of these is chided okay another one is remarked whispered and lamented right all of these are technically synonyms of the word said Right? But they exist on a, on a, you know, a spectrum of emotion, right? All of these have different meanings that are tied up to them, right? Um, and, and regardless, all of them are tied up with some sort of, you know, action or emotion, um, you know, that underpins this word. So if someone doesn't say something to you, they whisper it to you, right? Then, you know, what can that imply? Maybe they're trying to be secretive. Okay. Maybe they're a very shy person and they just talk very quietly right if they remarked well this is a fairly neutral word right um if they chided someone then you can tell that they are angry they're frustrated and they are ultimately you know what this word really means is that you are scolding someone okay if you exclaim something maybe you are excited about it okay maybe right remember different words have different meanings depending on the context it's all about the usage of the word right if you lament something it means you're feeling sad right if you maybe you're feeling sad about you know times that have gone by maybe you're feeling sad about something that's happened or something that you've done um, but you know that could be one of the emotions that's tied up with the word lament so there are different meanings reactions and actions that are tied up with um, synonyms of any word and that's another way of being a very effective writer is to understand these things and and match that with what tone you're trying to achieve right try and match that with the tone that you're going for so in this case mrs liang a resident that's been in kuji for a very long time right she's clearly very upset and uh, angry with the company right with the shipping company and so she decides to chide them right the beach has never looked more polluted and now we have to put our sweat into cleaning it up she lamented right again right using a better word than said and one that's emotionally charged the other thing that uh, mrs liang does over here is that um she mentions that uh, she needs to put that residents need to put their sweat into cleaning it up right uh, again that's not just saying something like we have to work hard to clean it up or it is very tiring to clean it up she says they need to put their sweat into it right which is a, again a more unique expression and an interesting way of saying the same thing okay next sentence amid mounting frustration from residents so again this is a this is you know it's it's continuous right we're not just saying that residents were frustrated which um you know can it, it's done and dusted that was in the past we're saying that there is mounting frustration from residents the situation is evolving situation is not just evolving but is actually worsening All right so the marker has uh, well, not the marker the reader has some sort of a sense of uh, of the timeline over which this is taking place um, and has the sense that you know this is not getting any better All right so amid mounting frustrations from residents the city of randwick and that's basically the council um, their response to the incident has been specifically criticized for its tardiness, right? Good vocab, right? Tardiness is a, is a good way of saying that something is delayed or late, right? So people are criticizing the council because they have been really, really slow with their response. Um, no moves have been made to organize a crisis response team in the past 48 hours. So again, that's giving us some sort of um, indication of what people are expecting. People expect that, you know, it's the job of a council to be able to deal with situations quickly and effectively, but that hasn't been done. Um, so they're upset. And then, of course, we have a quote. Now, you notice I deliberately didn't, you know, have a person over there, right? Um, some news reports do that if they refer to the same person that was speaking before. So in this case, Mrs. Liang, um, if you want to have, you know, a new witness or a new person to speak, you know, you can include them over here, right? Remember, there are lots of different people that you can call on. You can call on authority figures. Okay. You can call on residents. You can call on people that don't actually live there, but they just saw what happened, which are witnesses. Right. Um, but yeah, lots of different people that you can call on um, to give you statements. Uh, but either way, this person said it is unacceptable that senior citizens need to volunteer their time to do the government's job. Right. Again, just giving us some sort of sense of who has been the most affected by something like this. 
Okay, and then we move on to, you know, another side of the story, someone else is talking, which is Tourism Australia, right? So here you notice that there's no direct quote from Tourism Australia. Instead, the author of the news article is just saying what, what they would have said, right? Passive voice. So Tourism Australia expects that the unsightly occurrence not only presents an immediate hazard, again, giving us some indication of time frames. it's not only bad for people right now, right? Remember how before when we brainstormed different ideas, we talked about hazards, and that was one of the ideas that we've very quickly and sneakily weaved into here. Um, Tourism Australia expects that the unsightly occurrence, this ugly event, is not only an immediate hazard for hundreds of children that play on the beach each day, hundreds of children gives us a scale of just how bad things are over here, right? So um, it's not only affecting one or two kids or just a couple of people, a few residents here and there, but it's affecting hundreds and hundreds of different children that come to Coogee Beach to play. Right? So Tourism Australia says that not only does it affect them, but it could jeopardize all tourist activities in the area until Christmas. Right? Jeopardize is a great word. Um, you know, a synonym would be something like endanger. Right? Um, or you could think of, a, of an expression to say the same thing rather than just a, a synonym. But uh, Tourism Australia is saying that there are immediate risks and there are also long-term risks. And when a marker reads this, their thought is, okay, the reader clearly shows, sorry, the writer clearly shows um, that they understand not only the short-term impacts, right, the short-term, but they also understand the long-term impacts. And if you can do that, then that makes you a mature, comprehensive, and sophisticated writer. Well, that was our review of the 2021 writing test. I hope you guys found that helpful in terms of um, not only thinking about how to approach this particular text type, but also what different activities you can do to keep improving your standards of writing. Uh, I just want to leave you guys with a, with a quick quote from T.S. Eliot. And uh, T.S. Eliot said something very, very controversial. He said, good writers borrow and great writers steal. Now, please don't take this to mean that you need to go off the, go out there, read, you know, a bunch of things that really, really, you know, good writers do. Um, maybe you saw, you know, one of your friends writing pieces and it was amazing. So you just have to go ahead and write the exact same thing, right? That's not what this quote means. What it's saying is, um, you know, try and look for, uh, try and look for different elements of, um, you know, a good writing pieces, right? Good writing pieces can come in many different forms. We went through an exemplar just then. Um, or of course, you know, you might have some exemplars that you, you know, you've uh, read from your, your center before. Maybe, you know, someone has shown you their writing piece because it got 19 out of 20 or 20 out of 20. Maybe your teacher gives you a writing piece that they think is really, really good. Maybe you could even ask your, um, you know, your, your tutors, your mentors, your teachers for what they think, um, you know, is a, is a good piece of writing, right? And try and think about all the different elements that make that an effective piece. Remember before I was saying that you should try and mark your own piece, mark your own writing piece, um, and also think about how you can mark other people's pieces. And, and a part of that marking process is identifying the good things so that you can, um, you know, almost, almost steal them. And when I say steal, I mean, you want to try and emulate the things that they've done well, right? The things that they've done well, you know that it's it's a good trait that you should have. And that can be, you know, any element such as sophisticated vocab, unique expressions, uh, great structure, right? Maybe they have a really, really good way of structuring their writing piece. Maybe there are some, uh, you know, interesting stylistic elements or techniques that they use, right? Things that you think, uh, you know, have been done very well. And you'll only know that if you read more and if you're proactive with your reading and actively note down, you know, the, the good features um, and try and weave that into your own writing piece. Otherwise, I wish everyone all the very best in all of your academic writing related endeavors. I hope this helped.